Good afternoon, ninth grade students. We're continuing our read of Into the Clouds. Uh, thank you for joining in. We are starting on page um, 102 today uh, at the top of the page um, where Wisner is feeling the opportunity to kind of reach his goal, his dream of uh, making the summit. So let's see. From there it was just a three or four hour slog through the snow to the top of K2. Finally, the goal he'd been dreaming about for years lay within his grasp. But as he started the traverse, Wisner felt the rope go taut around his waist. He looked down and saw Pasang Lama glaring up at him, shaking his head. Night was not far off and the Sherpa did not want to be stuck high on the mountain in the pitch dark. He was refusing to move. Fritz stared down the rock face in disbelief. He had just made the most spectacular effort of his climbing career. It had brought them closer than anyone had ever been to the top of an 8,000 meter peak. Just 60 more feet of technical climbing and they would stroll to the top. He tried to tell Lama that the worst was behind them. He explained they were a long way from the safety of Camp 9. No matter what they did, they would be climbing in the dark. It would be better to take their time climbing to the summit and then descend the rock face in the light of the morning. Lama simply held the rope tight and refused to budge. Tomorrow, he said. For seven weeks, Basang Lama had climbed step for step with Fritz Weisner. He had outlasted Kukuli and every other Western climber on the expedition, but he was not going to challenge the highest reaches of K2 in the middle of the night. For Wisner, it was a moment of great tension. He could have dropped the rope and tried for the summit on his own, leaving Lama to defend or to fend for himself. After all, he was a simple three hour climb from a final step that would change his life. If we get up, he had barked during one of Durance's pounce, we shall all be the most famous alpinist in the world. Instead, Fritz Weisner decided it would be too dangerous for his partner to climb down alone. He told Lama to belay him. He turned his eyes away from the top of K2 and started the treacherous descent to Camp 9. The next day, July 20th, the four Sherpas at Camp 6 woke to bright blue skies and a calm wind. Outside their tents, the mountain glistened under the blinding sun. It was a beautiful day on K2, and no one was in a mood to enjoy it. Tendrup and Pasan Katar had last seen Wisner on July 14th. They had climbed with him to Camp 8, dumped their loads, and descended to join Tessring and Finsu. Since then, the four men had been stuck in limbo. Wisner expected them to carry more supplies to eight, but the climbing was treacherous and they weren't equipped to face it. And so they waited in conditions that grew more unbearable by the day. Their tents rested on tiny platforms carved into a slope as steep as a roof. Outside the tent flaps, they could take two steps on level ground. If they wanted more exercise, they had to dig steps into the slope and climb. Meanwhile, the altitude ate away at their health. Tendrup and Pasai and Katar had been above 20,000 feet for a month. Fensu and Tessarium for the better part of three weeks. They were losing weight. Every day their bodies grew weaker. What were their choices? Climbing was their livelihood. If they ignored orders and descended, word could get around that they were unreliable. But if they attempted the icy slopes alone to bring supplies or check on the summit team, they might not live to climb again. Wisner, Wolf, and Basang Lama had been high on the mountain for six days. How long did they need to make the summit? How long could they even survive at that great height? Finally, Tinder decided he had to do something. In the glare of the sun, he roped up with the song guitar and Finsu and led the way up the Black Pyramid, leaving his partners at Camp 7. He made his way cautiously up the ice slope above the pyramid. He had no crampons to grip the ice and no one to belay him. 
After a while, he stopped, unwilling to go farther. He balanced on the slope and peered up the mountain. Camp 8 couldn't have been more than 500 vertical feet above him. Between his perch and the camp, he thought he saw signs that an avalanche had swept the slope clean. Tendrup tilted his head and yelled up the mountainside. There was no reply. He yelled again. With a gentle wind, the mountain was quiet. Sound traveled far. Still, he heard nothing. He tried one more time. Then he turned, gathered Basan guitar, and soon climbed down the Black Pyramid to test ring. There was no sign of the summit climbers, he told them all. As far as he could tell, Weisner, Wolf, and Basan Lama had been swept off the mountain by an avalanche. Chapter 9 deserted, page 106. At the top of the ice slope that had terrified Tendrup, Dudley Wolf was very much alive, if not exactly well. On the morning of July 22nd, two days after Tendrup's calls had failed to rouse him, Wolf drowsed in his tent at Camp 8. It had been five days since he said goodbye to Wisner and Pasang Lama at the lip of the crevice. Once again, the Hermit of K2 had been alone on the mountain for nearly a week, this time at 25,300 feet. Wolf was fast running out of supplies. He'd never been good at lighting camp stoves and had burned through his supply of matches. Luckily, the weather had been beautiful. He'd been able to collect snow on a tarp, let it melt in the sun and soothe his raspy throat with sips of clear cold water. Still, he'd been living on canned ham, pemmican, cheese, and crackers. He was losing weight fast. For weeks, his brain had been starved for oxygen. It took a long time now to do simple tasks. He wasn't thinking clearly or quickly. As daylight gradually warmed the air in the tent, he heard the sound of boots crunching in the snow. Then a voice came through the tent flap. With effort, he pulled himself into a crouch and crawled out the door. He stood awkwardly on his frostbitten feet and greeted his two visitors from the upper reaches of K2. Fritz Weisner and Pasan Lama. Weisner took in the condition of the camp and its lone resident. He was enraged. He and Lama and even Wolf were driving their bodies to the edge of collapse on the highest reaches of the mountain, and they were getting no support from below. The entire expedition seemed to have fallen apart while he was not around to supervise. Where were the Sherpas who had promised to bring supplies from below? Where was Jack Durance? Didn't they understand he could not climb K2 alone? When he calmed down, Weisner filled Wolf in on the summit attempt. After darkness cut their first attempt short, Weisner and Lama had taken a rest day and then tried the ice slope directly under the Surat. It was no use. On their nighttime descent from the rock base, Lama had gotten his pack tangled in the ropes. As he wrestled it free, their crampons came loose and clattered down the mountainside. Without them, the ice traverse was treacherous and slow. They didn't have the strength or the daylight to finish the climb. Weisner hadn't given up on the summit. In fact, he had left his sleeping bag at Camp 9. He'd been hoping to find fresh supplies and arrest a climbing partner at Camp 8 and head back up the mountain. That was now out of the question. They would have to descend, at least for now. Once again, Dudley Wool found himself in his least favorable position on the mountain, pointed down. Wisner led the way through a thick fog, kicking steps in the snow and ice for the others to follow. Slowly, they made their way down the same treacherous slope that had turned Tendrup back two days earlier. A few hundred feet above Camp 7, they lost their precarious hold on the mountain. Wolf got tangled in the rope and pulled Wisner off balance. Wisner started to slide down the slope scraping at the snow with his ice axe to slow his fall. But before he could bring himself to a stop, the rope went taut and yanked Wolf and Basang Lama off the slope. They careened down past Wisner, jerking him into a somersault as they fell. The three men tumbled down the slope, headed for a rim that dropped off into cliffs of rock and ice. If they went over the edge, there would be nothing to stop them but the glacier. 7,000 feet below. As they slid ever closer to the rim, Weisner could feel the snow soften under him. He had a good grip on the axe now. He thrust it deep into the snow and held on with all his strength. 
The rope bit into his waist as Llama and Wolf began to slow. Llama would later say that the rope caught on a rock, but whatever the cause, Weisner felt himself come to a stop, face down in the snow. The tension on the rope eased. Below Weisner, Dudley Wolf and San Llama had also stopped falling. They clung to the slope, not more than 60 feet above the edge of the cliff. The men picked themselves up and staggered into camp seven just before dark. Wolf had lost his pack and his sleeping bag with it, but Song Lama had been battered in the fall. He had a broken rib and his lower back felt like it had been beaten with a sledgehammer. But as Wisner looked around, he realized they had bigger problems. He could barely believe his eyes. The camp looked like it had been ransacked by wolves. Two tents remained, but one of them had collapsed, its poles bent and broken. The other had been buried in snow. Food lay scattered on the ground along with two stoves and some fuel. There were no sleeping bags to be found. While they cleared snow off one working tent, Wisner used what strength he had left to rage at the men below. Not only had they left their leader and two others to fend for themselves high on the mountain, they had stolen supplies that were essential for survival. If he and Wolf ever made it back alive, they should have the others charged with criminal negligence. It was obvious to us that nobody had been at seven for many days or cared about the three men above, Wisner wrote in his diary, to the hell with them. Wisner was still fuming as they zipped themselves into the tent. The temperature plummeted, the three men huddled together with nothing but a thin Sherpa sleeping bag to cover them, hoping they would survive the night. I'm gonna stop there on page 111 as they are hoping to survive. Thanks so much, students. Hope to see you tomorrow. Take care of yourselves and have a really good afternoon. Bye.